That was not the worst of it, continued Dame Brinker, knitting slowly and trying to keep count of her stitches as she talked. That was not near the worst of it. The dreadful landlord went and cut up the young gentlemen's bodies into little pieces and threw them into a great tub of brine, intending to sell them for pickled pork. Oh, cried Gretchen, horror-stricken, though she had often heard the story before. Hans still continued unmoved and seemed to think that pickling was the best that could be done under the circumstances. Yes, he pickled them, and one might think that would have been the last of the young gentlemen, but no, that night St. Nicholas had a wonderful vision and in it he saw the landlord cutting up the merchant's children. There was no need of his hurrying, you know, for he was a saint. But in the morning he went to the inn and charged the landlord with the murder. Then the wicked landlord confessed it from beginning to end and fell down on his knees begging forgiveness. He felt so sorry for what he had done that he asked the saint to bring the young masters to life. And did the saint do it? asked Gretchen, delighted well knowing what the answer would be. Of course he did. The pickled pieces flew together in an instant, and out jumped the young gentleman from the brine tub. They cast themselves at the feet of St. Nicholas, and he gave them his blessing, and, oh, mercy on us, Hans. It will be dark before you get back if you don't start this minute. By this time, Dame Brinker was almost out of breath, and quite out of commas. She could not remember when she had seen the children idle away an hour of daylight in this manner, and the thought of such luxury quite appalled her. By way of compensation, she now flew about the room in extreme haste, tossing a block of peat upon the fire, blowing invisible dust from the table, and handing the finished hose to Hans all in an instant. Come, Hans, she said, as her boy lingered by the door. What keeps thee? Hans kissed his mother's plump cheek, and rosy and fresh, yet in spite of all the troubles. My mother is the best in the world, and I would be right glad to have a pair of skates, but... As he buttoned his jacket, he looked in a troubled way toward the strange figure crouching by the hearthstone. If my money would bring a meester from Amsterdam to see the father, something might yet be done. A meester would not come, Hans, for twice that money. And it would do no good if he did. Ah, how many guilders I once spent for that. But the dear good father would not waken. It is God's will. Go, Hans, and buy the skates. Hans started with a heavy heart, but since the heart was young and in a boy's bosom, it sent him whistling in less than five minutes. His mother had said thee to him, and that was quite enough to make even the dark day sunny. Hollanders do not address each other in affectionate intercourse as the French and Germans do, but Dame Brinker had embroidered for her Heidelberg family in her girlhood and she had carried its thee and thou into her rude home to be used in moments of extreme love and tenderness. Therefore, what keeps the Hans? sang an echo song beneath the boy's whistling and made him feel that his errand was blessed. Broek with its quiet, spotless streets, its frozen rivulets, its yellow brick pavements, and its bright wooden houses was nearby. It was a village where neatness and show were in full blossom. But the inhabitants seemed to be either asleep or dead. Not a footprint marred the sanded piles where pebbles and seashells lay in fanciful design. Every window shutter was closed as tightly as though air and sunshine were poison, and the massive front doors were never opened except on occasion of wedding, christening, or a funeral. Serene clouds of tobacco smoke were floating through hidden apartments, and children who otherwise might have awakened the place were studying in out-of-way corners or skating upon the neighborhood de canal. A few peacocks and wolves stood in the gardens, but they never enjoyed the luxury of flesh and blood. They were cut out in growing box and seemed guarding the grounds with a sort of green ferocity. Certain lively automata, ducks and women and sportsmen, stowed away in summer houses, waiting for the springtime when they could be wound up and rival their owners in animation. And the shining tiled roofs, mosaic courtyards, and polished house trimmings flashed up a silent homage to the sky, where never a speck of dust could dwell. Hans glanced toward the village as he shook his silver carches, and wondered whether it were really true, as he had often heard, that some of the people of Broek were so rich that they used kitchen utensils of solid gold. He had seen Mevfrau von Stoop's sweet cheeses in the market, 
and he knew that the lofty dame earned many a bright silver gilder in selling them. But did she set the cream to rise in golden pans? Did she use a golden skimmer? When her cows were in winter quarters, were their tails really tied up with ribbons? These thoughts ran through his mind as it turned his face toward Amsterdam, not five miles away, on the other side of the frozen Y. The ice upon the canal was perfect, but his wooden runners, so soon to be cast aside, squeaked a dismal farewell as he scraped and skimmed along. When crossing the Y, whom should he see skating toward him but the great Dr. Boykeman, the most famous physician and surgeon in Holland? Hans had never met him before, but he had seen his engraven likeness in many of the shop windows of Amsterdam. It was a face that one could never forget. Thin and lank, though a born Dutchman, with stern blue eyes and queer compressed lips that seemed to say, no smiling permitted. He certainly was not a very jolly or sociable-looking personage, no one that a well-trained boy would care to accost unbidden. But Hans was bidden, and that too by a voice he seldom disregarded, his own conscience. Here comes the greatest doctor in the world, whispered the voice. God has sent him. You have no right to buy skates when you might with the same money Purchase such aid for your father. The wooden runners gave an exultant squeak. Hundreds of beautiful skates were gleaming and vanishing in the air about him. He felt the money tingle in his fingers. The old doctor looked fearfully grim and forbidding. Hans's heart was in his throat, but he found voice enough to cry out just as he was passing. Mein Herr Beukemann! The great man halted and sticking out his thin underlip looked scowlingly about him. Hans was in for it now. Mein Herr, he panted, drawing close to the fierce-looking doctor. I knew you could be none other than the famous Boykeman. I have to ask a great favor. Come, muttered the doctor, preparing to skate past the intruder. Get out of the way. I have no money, never to give to beggars. I am no beggar, mein Herr, retorted Hans proudly at the same time producing his mite of silver with a grand air. I wish to consult you about my father. He is a living man, but sits like one dead. He cannot think. His words mean nothing. But he's not sick. He fell on the dikes. Hey, what? cried the doctor, beginning to listen. Hans told the whole story in an incoherent way, dashing off a tear once or twice as he talked and finally ending with an earnest... Oh, do see him, mine hair. His body is well. It is only his mind. I know this money is not enough, but take it, mine hair. I will earn more. I know I will. Oh, I will toil for you all my life. If you will but cure my father. What was the matter with the old doctor? A brightness like sunlight beamed from his face. His eyes were kind and moist. The hand that had lately clutched his cane as if preparing to strike was gently laid upon Hans's shoulder. Put up your money, my boy. I do not want it. We will see your father. It is hopeless, I fear. How long, did you say? Ten years, mein Herr, sobbed Hans. Radiant with sudden hope. Ah, a bad case. But I shall see him. Let me think. Today I start for Leiden to return in a week. Then you may expect me. Where is it? A mile south of Broek, mein Herr, near the canal. It is only a poor broken-down hut. Any of the children thereabout can point it out to your honor, added Hans, with a heavy sigh. They're all half afraid of the place. They call it the idiot's cottage. That will do, said the doctor, hurrying on. With a bright backward nod at Hans, I shall be there. A hopeless case, he muttered to himself. But the boy pleases me. His eye is like my poor Lawrence. Confound it. Shall I never forget that young scoundrel? And scowling more darkly than ever, the doctor pursued his silent way. Again, 
Hans was skating toward Amsterdam on the squeaking wooden runners. Again his fingers tingled against the money in his pocket. Again the boyish whistle rose unconsciously to his lips. Shall I hurry home, he was thinking, to tell the good news, or shall I get the waffles and the new skates first? <sighs> I think I'll go on, and so Hans bought the skates. Hans and Gretzel had a fine frolic early on that St. Nicholas Eve. There was a bright moon, and their mother, though she believed herself to be without any hope of her husband's improvement, had been made so happy at the prospect of the meester's visit that she had yielded to the children's entreaties for an hour of skating before bedtime. Hans was delighted with his new skates, and in his eagerness to show Gretzel how perfectly they worked, did many things upon the ice that caused the little maid to clasp her hands in solemn admiration. They were not alone, though, though they seemed quite unheeded by the various groups assembled upon the canal. The two von Hopes and Karl Schumel were there, testing their fleetness to the utmost. Out of four trials, Peter von Holp had beaten three times. Consequently, Karl, never very amiable, was in anything but a good humor. He had relieved himself by taunting young, young Schimmelpenink, who, being smaller than the others, kept meekly near them, without feeling exactly one of their party. But now a new thought seized Karl, or rather he seized a new thought and made an onset among his friends. I say, boys, let's put a stop to those young rag pickers from the idiot's cottage joining the race. Hilda must be crazy to think of it. Katrinka Flock and Ricky Corbus are furious at the very idea of racing with the girl, and for my part I don't blame them. So the boy, if we were spark of manhood in us, we were scorn the very idea of. Certainly we will, interposed Peter von Holt, purposefully uh, mistaking Carl's meaning. Who doubts it? No fellow with a spark of manhood in him would refuse to let in two good skaters just because they were poor. Carl wheeled about savagely. Not so fast, master. And I'd thank you not to put words in other people's mouths. You'd best not try it again. Ha <laughs> ha! laughed little Austin Valbert Schimmelpenick. Delighted at the prospect of a fight and sure that if it should come to blows, his favorite Peter could beat a dozen excitable fellows like Carl. Something in Peter's eye made Carl glad to turn to a weaker offender. He wheeled furiously upon Vost. What are you shrieking about, you little weasel? You skinny herring, you, you little monkey with a long name for a tail? Half a dozen bystanders and bystaters set up an applauding shout at this brave witticism, and Carl, feeling that he had fairly vanquished his foes, was restored to partial good humor. He, however, prudently resolved to defer plotting against Hans and Gretel until some time when Peter should not be present. Just then his friend Jacob Poot was seen approaching. They could not distinguish his features at first, but as he was the stoutest boy in the neighborhood, there could be no mistaking his form. Hello! Here comes Fatty! exclaimed Carl. And there's someone with him, a slender fellow, a stranger. Ha <laughs> ha! That's like good bacon, cried Ludwig. A streak of lean and a streak of fat. That's Jacob's English cousin, put in Master Vost delighted at being able to give the information. And that's his English cousin. And, oh, he's got such a funny little name. Ben Dobbs. He's going to stay with him until after the grand race. All this time the boys had been spinning, turning, rolling, and doing other feats upon their skates in a quiet way as they talked. But now they stood still, bracing themselves against the frosty air as Jacob Wood and his friend came near. This is my cousin, boys, said Jacob, rather out of breath. Benjamin Dobbs. He's a John Bull, and he's going to be in the race. All crowded boy fashion about the newcomers. Benjamin soon made up his mind that the Hollanders, notwithstanding their queer gibberish, were a fine set of fellows. If the truth must be told, Jacob had announced his cousin as Benjamin Dobbs, and called him Sean Poole. But as I translate every word of the conversation of our young friends, 
it is no more than fair to mend their little attempts at English. Master Dobbs felt at first decidedly awkward among his cousin's friends. Though most of them had studied English and French, they were shy about attempting to speak either. And he made very funny blunders when he tried to converse in Dutch. He had learned that Frau means wife, and Ja, yes, and Sporveg, railway, canals, canals, stormboat, steamboat, Overbruggen, drawbridges, beaten plasten, country seats, mein Heer, mister, Twiegeweg, duel or two fights, copper, copper, zadel, saddle, but he could not make a sentence out of these, nor use a long list of phrases he had learned in his Dutch dialogues. The topics of the latter were fine, but were never al alluded to by the boys. Like the poor fellow who had learned in Ollendorf to ask in faultless German, Have you seen my grandmother's red cow? When he reached Germany, discovered that he had no occasion to inquire after that interesting animal. Ben found that his book Dutch did not avail him as much as he had hoped. He acquired a hearty contempt for Jan van Gorp, a Hollander who wrote a book in Latin to prove that Adam and Eve spoke Dutch, and he smiled a knowing smile when his uncle Poot assured him that Dutch had great likeness with English. But it was much better language, much better. However, the fun of skating glides over all barriers of speech. Through this, Ben soon felt that he knew the boys well, and when Jacob, with a sprinkling of French and English for Ben's benefit, told of a grand project they had planned, his cousin could now and then put in a ya ja or nod in quite a familiar way. The project was a grand one, and there was to be a fine opportunity for carrying it out, for besides the allotted holiday of the festival of St. Nicholas, four extra days were to be allowed for a cleaning of the schoolhouse. Jacob and Ben had obtained permission to go on a long skating journey, no less a one than from Broek to The Hague, the capital of Holland, a distance of nearly fifty miles. And now, boys, added Jacob when he had told the plan, Who will go with us? I will, I will, cried the boys eagerly, and so will I, ventured little uh, Boston Valbert. Ha, <laughs> ha, laughed Jacob, holding his fat sides and shaking his puffy cheeks. You go, such a little fellow as you, why, youngster, you haven't left off your pads yet. Now in Holland, very young children wear a thin padded cushion around their heads and surmounted with a framework of whalebone and ribbon to protect them in case of a fall. And it is the dividing line between babyhood and childhood when they leave it off. Most had arrived at this dignity several years before. Consequently, Jacob's insult was rather too great for endurance. "'Look out what you say,' he squeaked. "'Lucky for you. "'When you can leave off your pads, you're padded all over.' "'Ha, ha, ha!' roared all the boys except Master Dobbs, who could not understand. "'Ha, ha!' and the good-natured Jacob laughed more than any. "'It, it is my fat, yeah. "'He says I be's pad mit fat,' he explained to Ben." So a vote was passed unanimously in favor of allowing the now popular host to join the party if his parents would consent. Good night, sang out the happy youngster skating homeward with all his might. Good night. We can stop at Harlem, Jacob, and show your cousin the big organ, said uh, Peter Van Holp eagerly, and at Leiden, too, where there's no end to the sights, and spend the day and night at The Hague for, for my married sister who lives there We'll be delighted to see us, and the next morning we can start home. All right, responded Jacob, who was not so much of a talker. Ludwig had been regarding his brother with enthusiastic admiration. Hurrah for you, Pete. It takes you to make plans. Mother will be as full of it as we are when we tell her we can take her love direct to Sister Van Gen. My, but it's cold, he added, cold enough to take a fellow's head off his shoulders. We'd better go home. 
What if it is cold, old tender skin? cried Carl, who was busily practicing a step which he called the double edge. Great skating we should have by this time if it was as warm as it was last December. Don't you know? If it wasn't an extra cold winter and an early one into the bargain, we couldn't go? I know. It's an extra cold night, anyhow, said Ludwig. Whew. I'm going home. Peter von Hope took out his bulgy gold watch and holding it toward the moonlight as well as his benumbed fingers would permit, called out, Hello! It's nearly eight o'clock. St. Nicholas is about by this time, and I, for one, want to see the little one stare. Good night! Good night! cried one and all, and off they started, shouting, singing, and laughing as they flew along. Where were Gretzel and Hans? Ah, how suddenly joy sometimes comes to an end. They had skated about an hour, keeping aloof from the others, quite contented with each other. And Gretchel had exclaimed, Ah, Hans, how beautiful, how fine, to think that we both have skates. I tell you, the stork brought us good luck when they heard something. It was a scream, a very faint scream. No one else upon the canal observed it, but Hans knew its meaning too well. Gretchel saw him turn white in the moonlight as he hastily tore off his skates. The father, he cried, he has frightened our mother. And Gretchel ran after him toward the house as rapidly as she could. We all know how before the Christmas tree began to flourish in the home life of our country, a certain right jolly old elf with eight tiny reindeer used to drive his sleigh load of toys up to our housetops and then bound down the chimney to fill the stocking so hopefully hung by the fireplace. His friends called him Santa Claus, and those who were most intimate ventured to say Old Nick. It was said that he originally came from Holland, and doubtless he did. But if so, he certainly, like many other foreigners, changed his ways very much after landing upon our shores. In Holland, St. Nicholas is a veritable saint, and often appears in full costume, with his embroidered robes glittering with gems and gold, his mitre, his crozier, his jewel gloves. Here, Santa Claus comes rollicking along on the 25th day of December, our holy Christmas morn. But in Holland... St. Nicholas visits the earth on the 5th, a time especially appropriated to him. Early on the morning of the 6th, he distributes his candies, toys, and treasures, then vanishes for a year. Christmas Day is devoted by the Hollanders to church rites and pleasant family visiting. It is on St. Nicholas' Eve that their young people become half wild with joy and expectation. To some of them, it is a very sorry time for the saint is very candid. And if any of them have been bad during the past year, he is quite sure to tell them so. Sometimes he carries a birch rod under his arm and advises the parents to give them scoldings in place of confections and floggings instead of toys. It was well that the boys hastened to their abodes on that bright winter evening, for in less than an hour afterward the saint made his appearance in half the homes of Holland. He visited the king's palace, and the selfsame moment appeared in Annie Bowman's comfortable home. Probably one of our silver half-dollars would have purchased all that his saintship left at the peasant Bowman's. But a half-dollar's worth will sometimes do for the poor what hundreds of dollars may fail to do for the rich. It makes them happy, fills them with peace and love. Hilda von Gleck's little brothers and sisters were in a high state of excitement that night. They had been admitted into the grand parlor. They were dressed in their best, and had been given two cakes apiece at supper. Hilda was joyous as any. Why not? St. Nicholas would never cross a girl of fourteen from his list, just because she was tall and looked almost like a woman. On the contrary, he would probably exert himself to do honor to such an august-looking damsel. Who could tell? So she sported and laughed and danced as gaily as the youngest, and was the soul of all their merry games. 
Father, mother, and grandmother looked on approvingly. So did grandfather, before he spread his large red handkerchief over his face, leaving only the top of his skull cap visible. The kerchief was his ensign of sleep. 